a lot of people, they might wonder like, why, like, why do people get into the industry? I'd love for you to talk about like your childhood and some of the stepping stones with that and how that really forced you to chase after financial independence and to do things by yourself and almost develop this, I'm going to do it on my own, like screw everybody else mentality. And then how that led you into becoming an an adult entertainer. People get involved for many different reasons. Speaking for myself, and luckily you got to read both my books, so you learned a bit more about me since you interviewed with me. You know, I was forced out of my own young. I was still in high school. I did not want to have a GED. To me, at 15, a bunch of my friends' sisters were getting pregnant, and they were dropping out of school and getting GEDs. And for some reason at that age, a GED uh, signified, like, I'm a teen pregnancy. I can't do this. And I remember going to my principal and saying, like, I don't have parental guidance right now. I'm not getting emancipated. This is going to be the start to me figuring out how I'm going to be financially secure. And, you know, quickly in doing bikini contests and finding random ways at strip clubs to make money, you start to realize where the real money is. You know, just because I didn't have a good upbringing didn't mean that I didn't have good examples in that upbringing. And I would say my greatest examples were my grandparents who, after World War II, started their own business together. And I watched everything about this business and it made me understand how to run your own business. Even though I was young and it was survival and I didn't, I knew I couldn't go to jail because my parents were not going to bail me out. I wasn't going to have any support. I'm completely on my own. What is the most realistic and legal way to make as much money as possible so I can set up my financial freedom, my financial independence, my financial future? And that really just became this thread in my life. And I realized I did like dancing. It was fun. It was easy. In the late 80s, early 90s, we were still getting paid $25 an hour just to be at a strip club. And then when you went on stage, you made all your tips and everything else. There was no lap dances. There was no other ways to make money. We were getting paid. The money was so great. But I also, in a two-year span at the same club, realized you're going to see the same people all the time. The money is going to tap out. And at that club, we had features that came through every week. And they were porn stars, Playboy Playmates, models, magazine models. And they got paid a great deal of money to go to these clubs all over the world and do the same thing I was doing. The mission in that two years that I was at Al Simon Cabaret was really to interview as many of these starlets as I could to figure out where the money was how to maximize the money, what things to do, what things not to do. Uh, we only had VHS back then. So I had, I would, they would give me a, a tape, you know, and I would watch these tapes and I'd be watching them very like critically, like, okay, would I be comfortable with that? How do I feel about that? It was to the point on my second year of interviewing where I was looking at VHSs in the black of box. Blockbuster used to have these little rooms where you could look at porn and rent it. And they were usually behind like beads or something. And I would go back and I'd realize, oh, no, the VHS tapes are on the side. So I really wanted my photo solo on the box covers of these movies because I knew you made more money on the road if you were featured predominantly on box covers. That was what the covers were called for the VHS. And if you were in magazines. So that was really the pursuit. So by studying where the money is, how to make it, what to do and not to do, Then it became hiring photographers in Reading, Pennsylvania, getting those photos printed, sending them by mail to California and starting this like long distance relationship with all of these companies that I eventually was going to be able to go out there and meet with. And to me, it was part of just like, I'm setting up a real business here. No one saw it as a real business. My friends never understood what I did. But anywhere where you're making real money and you're paying real taxes, it's a real business. So personal opinions aside, I'm contributing to society. Very young at 24, purchased my first home. You know, like I'm doing the adult things. I just fast tracked it. And when you don't have parents and you don't have a family relationship, it is a lot easier to say, fuck it, I'll just do porn. Do you think that in in some way, looking back at it now and doing all this work on yourself, it was in some ways a mechanism to escape a lot of the pain that you were going through as as a kid? It was. And I, you know, expression I use often is I definitely went into the business broken and came out so whole. Like it empowered me so much in in incredible ways. I mean, first of all, financial freedom. You know, as soon as I had money, I was like, all right, 
I can have my own insurance. I can go and see a therapist. I can do all of these things for well-being. I can do, you know, events at different, the Chopra uh, spot in Southern California, like all these wellness things. I could afford these things so I could begin to really work on myself. I was very fortunate uh, that I didn't fall into the traps. You know, I'm not a big drinker. Sure, we all had our party phase. I I still love edibles and smoke weed, but um, I never fell into Coke and meth. And I would watch girls just like, if you took 10 girls and you put them in the industry at the same time and you watched a time lapse of three years, it is wild what could happen with those 10 girls. Two of them could be powering forward and feature dancing and succeeding. And two of them have already lapsed on and off or, or get into drugs or do things. And it's, it's a cycle. And so when you see yourself looking back and realize I was fortunate because addictions are, it's not a choice. And, and a lot of wonderful people fall into a trap that they can't get themselves out of. And we, you know, we can't discount that there's still great people. And so I feel lucky that that wasn't me. I, I, it, it could have captivated me. It didn't. So that made it a lot easier for me to continue to grow and and, and do more things. And this business enabled me the three things that I wrote as my mission statement at 16 years old. All I wanted in life was to be financially independent, travel and see the world and make my own schedule. And in no other line of work could I have been doing that my whole life. Before we recorded, we were, I was talking to you and I was saying that you, you strike me as somebody who's a go-getter and that whatever you go after, you get it and you do it right, you do it well. And you were telling me, you know, the one thing, the one life goal that I have that I want is happiness. Why is that? Where does that stem from? I didn't see a lot of happy growing up. You know, my parents got divorced young. It was pretty bitter. My dad didn't want to pay my mom child support, you know, in the Italian culture. If your woman leaves you, she deserves nothing. I learned this growing up. So my mom worked a lot of jobs. She was always burned down and exhausted. I didn't see happiness from her. My Italian family would just kind of go to church, get back, drink, smoke, gamble, gossip, and fight with each other. I didn't see a lot of happiness there. I was growing up in a town that was going through changes. Pfizer had moved into the small town of Easton, PA, where I grew up, and it contaminated our our creek and our lake, and people were getting sick. And like I just watched a lot of sadness. And crazy how TV could inspire us. But I remember watching 90210. And watching them go to school in California and be able to go outside during the day. I was like, what? Look at that weather and all of it. And I just saw their lifestyle as a different happy. And so what I realized was I wasn't going to ever grow in my small town. And the simple things I really wanted were those three things. And I have them. And, you know, happiness is not the stuff that you have. It's the peace that you feel, in my opinion. That's my opinion of it. It's just knowing that no one's stressing me. I've got no major troubles. I'm, I'm financially okay. I can have what I need and what I want. I live in a great place. I have friends. That's the peak of it all, right? What else are we here for? I think a lot of times our upbringing, it's like this campfire. And sometimes our choices can serve almost as like gasoline on the fire. Um, I want to read some, a quote from your, from your first book. And the, and the reason is because you, know, you and I were also talking like the biggest thing you deal with now is abandonment, which came from your childhood. And I think it seems from learning more about your story that being in the industry in a way contributed to that. And here's what I'm going to read. It says, the insecurities I have about dating usually stem from whether the other person will be able to deal with what I've done. I question to this day if I'll ever be able to carry that pressure. A career in porn is something that doesn't go away, and it's a lot to ask another person to carry. I was always waiting for the other shoe to drop, And usually would just drop that shoe myself by doing things that would make the guy never want to date me again. My choices sabotaged my future love life. I did it to myself, but it wasn't intentional. Explain that. Not everybody has the same level. Like one of my girlfriends who's in the industry, she's like, you're a little bit too empathetic. So your problem is you're constantly going to be worried about that guy that you're in love with that's going to go out with his friends. And I have examples because I've dated guys where they'll go golfing with their friends and their friends will just start making a bunch of like really rude comments or like, oh, I was you know, beaten off to your girl last night, like things like this. No guy wants to hear that about their girlfriend. No guy. And so then they come back and then they're shitty with you. And then they're kind of saying like, oh, I don't like this. That's forever. And it's, and for my girlfriend that said it to me, I'm like, there's different levels of fame. You know, the Sarah Palin thing really made me a household name. 
uh, I think I'm part of the sexual fiber of the universe at this point because porn is not time sensitive. So people are still finding me. I don't have any times of demarcation where you could see like, oh, this was before all of her tattoos or after her tattoos. Oh, this was when she was a blonde. Not when she was. No, I kind of look the same. I just have been aging, uh, which is just happening. But so I think, you know, realizing that it's a pressure that you carry because you don't know what the other person can. What we endure is what we endure. It could be heavy for us. Now you bring someone else that doesn't have the training, the, the, the path that you've walked to actually endure that kind of scrutiny or judgment, or maybe their family won't want you to be around. Maybe people will be weird with you at a wedding. Like there's a lot that comes with it, just a lot. And so, yeah, in my younger life, I would truly sabotage things. And, you know, being married and being with Mike was a good calming thing for me. Mike was a great seven years in my life. We still connect on our wedding anniversary. We still talk on birthdays. Um, I needed him. He really grounded me a lot. And then after him going out on my own is when I think I grew the most. This, this quote kind of stems from a place of in strong insecurity when I read it from your first book. And I know you've grown a lot since then. You're way more confident. Do you still feel this sense of of shame when you're going out and, and, and meeting somebody? Because you seem like somebody who's, who's very discerning now. When, yeah, when, that, when, when who you I'm see. unfazed now. And thank God for OnlyFans, right? Because it's become a living room conversation. There's a story in the post almost every day about OnlyFans. We've got celebrities on OnlyFans. We've got people we've watched for years, Carmen Electra on. So I think it's been the great neutralizer. So even if I had that one little hair of doubt left, it's been wiped clean. And now I'm more in like, a, I don't give a what you think situation. And how's your view on, on marriage now? Cause I know in your first book, you talk about like, you said something like, I, I haven't given up. I'll never, I'll never give up my hope for love and marriage. Like when you talked about it, I loved being married. I love being married. I loved cooking for somebody every day. I loved being what I called myself as the household manager. I'm a really good household manager. Um, I loved baking for him and waiting on him and, and it was great. And so I'm not opposed to getting married again at all. Um, but now I've also become fiercely independent. I have opportunities in many different places, regions, countries. And so now the way I bounce, that's almost intrusive to somebody like, Hey, I probably last year I traveled 240,000 miles. I might've been in a home in New York, maybe a total of a hundred days at the most, you know, that's not really conducive for a relationship. So, um, I've been just keeping it simple, but I still do believe it's possible. I still do. I have no qualms about getting married. I never wanted kids. That's never changed. But yeah, I've changed my outlook on that. But when I was younger, it was a lot to carry. But also the world has evolved so much. I think so many more people know someone that like, hey, our neighbor, you know, does adult content. Oh, our neighbor's on OnlyFans. Oh, he's a director or she's a photographer. I think we've reached a point where we've realized that, you know, sex work is real work. As long as it's legal sex work to me, it's real work. I know now you're more against people getting into the industry. Like you try to almost, I've heard you like talk people out of getting into the porn industry. Yeah. Why? I just want to know their whys. You know, when somebody comes to me and says, I want to get into the industry, I ask them, you know, do you have a five and a 10 year plan? Um, are you comfortable having a face to face conversation with your family, your friends? Are you prepared for the security issues that you're going to face? All you need is one fan, one fan to become obsessed and be outside where you live and you're moving all the time. You know, there's all these elements that I just don't think everyone understands. And in porn, you know, I, before I entered this space, I knew this, if I wasn't going to make big money, I was wasting my life away. So if I wasn't going to be a contract girl and go on the road and feature dance and be on these box covers, do international tours, then I was wasting my time. So I give everyone a threshold now. I say, well, how much do you think you could make a month on OnlyFans? Okay, let's take out the commission. Let's take out the taxes. Let's take out the expense. Now let's look at this number. Do you want to be on the internet forever naked, having sex for this number? If you do, let's do this. You want to do this, but you have to be an exhibitionist, which I was. You have to be comfortable being naked in front of people, which I am. You have to be very comfortable sexually and curious, which I am. But a lot of people that I meet are not. They are literally just looking at that New York Post article and going, that girl's making a million dollars a month. She was a teacher. I was a teacher. I should do this. Oh, no, 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 no. It's a real decision. 
uh, because it's like getting a tattoo on your face. It is there forever. And any job that you're going to take that is forever, you should really put that thought into it. And for me, not having access to the internet, having to write to the companies in California, having to learn about the business for two years, I think that gave me the time to be like, yes, I watched porn every three days because I was meeting a girl at Al's that would give me a movie and I'd watch it and get to know the other talent. Then when they would come into the club, I'd be like, oh, yeah, I remember her from this movie. I was studying this craft that I was getting ready to allow create a life for me. And the industry created such an incredible life for me, which I'm still living. You know, I still do what I call fringe activities, hosting at strip clubs. I'm at Sapphire all the time. I'll be there for the Super Bowl. I go internationally. Last year, I went to Greece for a trade show. I went to Australia for a trade show. The year before that, I went to Switzerland. Like, it's kind of great being Lisa Ann. What's your advice to some of these content creators that we're talking about, people who are on OnlyFans and sites like that, when like the barrier to entry with porn was way different decades ago, right? You had to like go into a store, you had to like show your ID. Yes. There was like this walk was, of shame, right? Coming a out. Brown bag when you yeah, leave it always right. been a brown bag with no leg out label. And and now that doesn't exist. Now you can just literally like sign up on a website or go to a website and kind of essentially like get what you want. Um, and I know that there's a lot of people that would say that that has a strong impact on like your mental health, neuroplasticity in the brain, changes your brain if you do it enough. Do you believe that, I mean, given, I mean, not, not necessarily your experience, because I think you were in it at a completely different time, but do you have some of these girls that you're talking to, are they saying, are, they, are you talking to them about like mental health and how some of this stuff can impact like their ability to deal with, you know, external validation, rom romantic relationships and stuff like that? It's one of the reasons I'm, 100% not anti-porn in any way, shape, or form, but it is one of the reasons why you said I am known to talk people out of it because I want to be sure you are mentally prepared. I feel like I was so fucking broken when I got in the business that there, there's, there's no reason. There was nothing left. I was stripped down to the bare minimum and I was no family, no parents, no existence on my own making all of these decisions. And so it's very different. A lot of people have a lot of other things going on. They've had the opportunity. What I do tell people that just get in and that are doing really well is if you can challenge yourself when you first get in, and I would just love to, to just in my life accomplish a dozen people doing this. If you could challenge yourself to save every single dime you make for the first 90 days and invest that money and long-term invest that money. Just take that 90-day chunk. Be like, okay, now you've already created something because now you've put money aside. Whether you need to pull it out to start another business down the road, but I find the problem is the money becomes intoxicating and the spending happens so quickly because you keep thinking that money is gonna replenish. And you might've been a 90-day one-hit wonder and now with OnlyFans, someone's moving on over to another person. So I, I'm really trying to express the saving because it's so inconsistent. And by the way, these platforms could go away at any time. Credit card processors, elections, politicians, all of these people play a huge role in the financial security of the adult industry, which we have watched changed since the 90s a million ways over. You talked about how when you went into the industry, you were broken and you came out whole. But there was this, also this massive reinvention of Lisa Ann after the industry that has shaped who you are today. You know, talk about what was the breaking point for you where you realized like, I can't like live like this for the rest of my life. I need to, to change and evolve and grow. Before, when I was mapping out my retirement, uh, we had a really rough year in the industry in 2013. And we had quite a few HIV positives. We had quite a few shutdowns. We had a performer who knew he had syphilis that was faking his test. and. We had uh, a lot of, we had a hepatitis faking his test and still working and those things. I was like, okay, these are viable threats on my overall well-being for the rest of my life. I have not yet contracted something that isn't curable. And now people are contracting things that are treatable, but not curable. And I remember going to ABN that year and they were having a big discussion for talent about all of us taking prep. And I was like, okay, once the industry leaders start telling me, none of them are doctors. 
And I did the research on PrEP. PrEP is great to protect. It's a great prophylactic if your partner is positive. It is not a great prophylactic if you're having sex with multiple people because it lowers your immune system. A lot of things that are great for partner to partner are not a Band-Aid for somebody who's having sex with 30 to 50 people a month. And so that really gave me this, okay, can't do it. Like, these are no longer my people. I'm feeling really afraid of everyone. I've got to start to plant my feet on the outside. How am I going to do this? This is only going to get worse. Like, I just saw it spiraling. And I gave myself that whole next year. And I told no one I was retiring, which ended up later blowing up in my face and costing me a ton of money and making me have to go to court and all of this because once I wasn't going to be making people money anymore, they all fucking hated me. And they all just pretty much wanted me dead. Like, what? She just cut off our biggest financial life supply. So um, that reinvention was about another time of being broken down. But I was connecting with myself on that way out. I was having fun. I was making better money than ever. I was doing all the things I wanted to do. I didn't like the tone that was being brought into the industry. I didn't like the incestual scenes. I didn't, I don't mind MILF. MILF can be a hot woman with the pool guy. Great. I didn't like the mommy play. I didn't like any, all of that was making me just like, ooh, I feel so uncomfortable here. I felt like a boomer in a, in a millennial situation. I was like, this just doesn't jive with me. I don't like fans calling me mommy. That is disgusting. And so as I was outgrowing it and it was kind of changing, there was this expanding and contracting. And I think I really got to know myself then because I think at that point, I still thought my whole identity was the industry. And that if I pulled away, I was going to be nobody again. And that was what made me realize like, no, 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 you've created your own identity. Like you're free to go now. You've done your time. And if this doesn't suit you, I was having so much anxiety about catching something. My last year in the business, every time I was driving to set, I would hear a voice saying, this is going to be the day you're going to get something. You're going to have something for the rest. It was so loud and so intense that I was like, this is your own gut is telling you this is not good for you anymore. You got to stop. It seems like you always had this inner voice, this North star inside of you throughout your life to where you could toe the line with certain things where a lot of people would have just gone off the deep end. You talked about how you had these certain standards and boundaries with your industry. And it's kind of the same thing I would imagine in the, in the, in the drug world where people like they won't do certain things. They have certain boundaries. What kept you like on that path? I mean, given your childhood that was incredibly toxic and traumatic, you had no guidance from your parents. I mean, I know you had guidance from other people, but how did you develop that? Not only the business acumen, but that sense of just flow and how to have those types of boundaries in your life. I knew that I did not get into the adult industry to make my life worse. I knew I did not take this step and do something permanent that was going to be present in my life to not save money, to not live well, to not invest in things. And money is power. I read, I would sit in on speakers at like holiday inns that were giving like Stephen Covey for the seven steps of highly effective people. Like I would read what was going on at the hotel. Remember, you're on the road in the 90s. You have no internet. You're reading the newspaper cover to cover every day. So it is something to do. You have about seven channels in your hotel. You become a sponge. And there's not so much stimulating you at all times. You're in a hotel room, right? You don't want to go anywhere. You're alone. You got to wait till you go into the club. That's until nine o'clock at night. I learned. I just knew that there was no way I was going to take this step and not make my life better. And how I saw my life better was I just wanted to live in a safe place. I wanted to have food. I wanted to feel secure. I wanted to have savings. I wanted to have insurance. I just wanted to have the best of all of the basics we have in America. I want to talk about some of the collateral damage that can happen like from being in the industry and getting out of it. My, my bias is always, is, is, my bias is towards like addiction. I know when people like come out of a situation like that, where they're in and doing something that maybe it feels good in the moment, but they get out of it and they're like, yeah, I, I definitely shouldn't have done some of those things. And now you have to like unwind a lot of that stuff that was like now pent up as a result of some of those decisions. I know you, you talked about like intimacy and your love life and how some of that was, was scarred. What other things that you really have to work on when you got out of the industry from like a mental health perspective? 
I had to work on trusting people. And especially, I really wanted to work on my female friend group. When I was in the industry, it was hard to have a large female friend group. I have three girlfriends that I've been friends with since I moved to California. So one of them, she's my best friend. And, you know, she's been there for me. She's a financial planner. She was going to school for that when we met. It was very hard as a girl in the industry to meet women outside. So one of the biggest things I did, and now I run women's groups here in the city where I get 20 to 30 women together uh, for brunch. And we just all get to network with each other, all different walks of life. Uh, They're fun and a nightmare to put together because you're trying to skit all these people in on one day. But it was important to me to connect with women and and be a woman, not a porn star, not a stripper, uh, just a woman and be able to hear their stories and learn more about their lives and what they're involved in, and whether it's their schools for their children or whether it's their works and their careers. Or You learn through other people's experiences what they love and hate about their job, how they work with their coworkers, how they manage arguments with their husband, how they plan family, family vacations. That was a big missing gap for me, but I knew it was going to take me a while to trust women because though I met some great women in the business, um, in the industry, when women are backstabbing, they are not just backstabbing. They're like brutal backstabbing. I mean, send porn to your parents backstabbing, send links to your parents' phones backstabbing. These are evil, vindictive people. And so having to get through that level of that's who everybody was to me. I was scared of everyone. I had no friends in the business. We just would see each other on set. We'd take photos at expos. I talked to no one for years, getting over that hump. And once I got over that hump, coming back to doing events like Exotica, I hadn't done them for so many years, but I realized there's a sisterhood here and it's important for me to be present. So now I want to go back in and see if I can trust these women again, some different women, some new women, some and build relationships with people who probably want someone on the outside, but that has a foundational connection with them. So I went in reverse. I kind of stopped talking to everybody in the industry and not going to any events, built my core group of girlfriends outside of the three that I already had, felt more comfortable talking to women. I'll still have an unusual female experience. And I had one the other night, which I shared with you in the hallway. I was sitting at my favorite restaurant that I go to like once a month alone. I go to the bar. Bartender knows what I want. Go get a menu. I, I'm sitting in a group, of just all women, just so happen all women. The long and the short of it is I talk with these two for a couple of hours and they're from Long Island. I told them I was getting ready to walk home. I live close. How high is your apartment? Da, da, da. We'll do a walkthrough. Sure. Let me take you back to my apartment. No problem at all. So I take them back, walk them through. When they're looking in my office, they see the plaque for my book. And I'm like, hey, I can give you both a copy and walk you out. About an hour or two later, I get a very disgusted text uh, from one of the women. She took a picture of the back cover of my book. And it text was like, oh, you're a porno star. That's gross. Why would you do that? And I was just like, I'm sorry, please don't judge a stranger. And that's been our last interaction. But it has been so long since I had one of those that the next day I journaled about it. I was like, oh, you know what? This was almost refreshing. I've gotten a little bit too comfortable. Normally I would sit at that bar. Bartender was shocked I was talking to anybody. Normally I take my phone. I have a stand. I want a McAfee episode that I missed throughout the week. I'll watch that episode. And I have a great time with myself. You know, you can't trust everyone, but it's a good reminder that there's still people that don't accept people for people. They sat with me for three hours. You knew, you got to know who I was as a human being. A job I had now made me disgusting to you. It's a great reminder that people are still like that. And I'm so thankful to the group of girlfriends that I have that have never been involved in the industry, that have accepted me for me and love me for me. And it's it's a very warm feeling. Like I mentioned to you, I really didn't know you in your previous life. I've just known you now. And so I see you in a totally different light than a lot of other people do. And I would imagine that being in the industry that you were in and being so famous and people knowing you for somebody that you weren't right, you know, being this character in these in these movies, did you ever find yourself like morphing into a different version of yourself to please the camera and please the audience more? Or were you always kind of consistent with who Lisa Ann actually was at your core? 
I was always consistent on camera, but believe it or not, the morphing happened on my in my personal life. Uh, when the milk boom happened, I realized like it was great because, you know, you're an older woman in the industry. You're working with these young, hot guys and they're in great shape and they're super nice and good looking. And so I realized when I was going out on the road, I was like, now I'm attracted to these younger guys. And so there was like a, this three to four year span where I realized this was really happy. I was like, oh my gosh, this is, this is starting to become like, these are not guys that I'm going to have a serious relationship with, but they're also guys that I never, ever looked at in a sexual way before. I would always just be at work and do my work thing. And, and then I was like, oh, this is like, it's, it's, it's becoming me. So it did become me. And when it became me, I let it happen. You know, my last tour on the road, my security guy was the only person that knew I was going to stop feature dancing. And we were getting to the point where we were starting to get scared in some of the clubs because the fights would get big, like so big that the cops would just come in and mace the whole club. So everybody would have to walk outside like chaos. And so on that last tour, I was like, look, um, we're legitimately calling this the horror tour because this is going to be my last chance to hook up with random young dudes with you in the hotel room next door, making sure nobody murders me. So this part of my life is going to end. So let's rock this out. We had so much fun that last year on the road. It was just like a, a ceiling of the deal of like, you know, I'm hanging up my cleats and I might as well go out with a Super Bowl run. So that's what I did my last year on the road. And then how did you begin to redefine yourself after the, the MILF era of your life? Because like I said, like now, if I, if I didn't know what you did before, I wouldn't have thought it. I wouldn't even have known you've done porn. You don't strike me looking at you now as somebody that was a former porn star. Just, it's just hard to really kind of tell, right? So what was the process like of, of reinvention for you after that? Big process. Uh, I knew there were going to be many stages of this process. So at the year mark that I knew I was going to be retired, the first thing I did was went to my plastic surgeon. At the time, I had huge boobs. Went to my plastic surgeon, said, I want to retire. This is the date I'm going to do my last gig. I want to get my boobs reduced immediately. I also knew I was going to be changing my diet and letting my bangs grow out. My bangs were a very like big part of the Sarah Palin thing. They were a big part of that MILF thing. So I was like, all right, here's going to be the three stages of me redefining myself physically, how I look, how I feel, what I'm putting out there, how I present myself. You know, when you're in any sort of television, camera, content creation, you end up doing a lot of things to yourself, your face, filler, uh, lips, all of these things because everybody else is doing them. And you're always like keeping up with, and this is the look. And so when you step back and you say, okay, I'm doing none of this, you cannot believe how much you start to morph back into yourself again. My first year, not in the industry, it took about two years. Over a two-year span, I lost 55 pounds, having my breasts reduced. And now I want to get them reduced again because now that I'm smaller, I feel like I just look like a smaller whole version of what I looked like before because now they look big because 55 pounds is a lot. But it was really that yo-yo of eating, you know, being on set and having people say you're getting too thin, you're losing your booty, you got to eat. Okay, great you know, then you're over here and it's like, okay, you got to lose this weight because we need you to do and this constant yo-yo and fillers and all these things. I was like, this is the, this is the, once I do this surgery, I'm not doing any of this. I'm eating on a consistent, I went plant-based. I was like, you're going to be eating at home. You're not on the road eating at the same times. I just changed how I took care of myself to put a different product out to the universe. A lot of times people will say, well, I live life with no regrets and I don't regret anything in my life. And I kind of always will call some sort of BS because there has to be something in some, like I, I know for me, like one of the things that I deeply regret is the way that I handled the relationship with, with my mom, my side of the street on that, because I know I probably could have done something to maybe bring us closer at that time. And instead I did some stuff that pushed her away and that helped change our relationship for quite some time. But those were the only tools you had at that time. You didn't know this then. Right. True. True. You were working with what you had. Yeah. Yeah. No, I totally agree with that. But with you knowing what you know now about yourself and having the life that you do now, is there any part of your journey with everything that you regret? No, absolutely not. Because I would not be in this spot looking at the camera that says number three right here, right now one sliding door theory, one small incremental change. It could have all been different for me. I might not have done the Palin thing. I might not have been in the Eminem video. I might not have ever been married or divorced. Like 
all of it built me to be who I am. And if you reach, once you reach that point in life where you truly love yourself and you can be at home, like there's so many times where I'm at home alone. I'm like, I should feel really guilty about how much I love being home alone and doing my own thing and how content I am. And, you know, um, once you find that space, you can't look back and erase something because you're worried erasing that one thing that you regret changes the whole trajectory of how it kind of landed. I was watching a video one time and they were interviewing, I don't know if it was a, a current porn star or former porn, porn star, and they were documenting her life. The interviewer was like, why are you always smiling? Whoever it was was like, because I'm hiding back all the tears and I want people not, I don't want people to know that I'm struggling so much. Bless her heart. Was there ever a moment like that for you where you were showing up? Because you seem like, again. No, you know, again, the misconception with the amount of content out there that it was my full-time job ever doing adult films, it's weird because it never was. I was always feature dancing. I mean, there were years I feature danced 50 weekends a year. That's on the road 50 weekends a year. That's not in LA. That's on the road dancing Thursday, Friday, Saturday, flying back Sunday, Monday. I'd go in the body shop, you know, massage, nails, all of that. Like that was a constant grind. I always did appearances. So I wouldn't have put myself on set or in front of a camera if I didn't feel well. If I was mentally unstable in any way, shape, or form, I would have no problem saying to somebody, I can't give you a quality product today. I never booked myself to the point where I was so burned out and hated what I was doing and, and didn't want to be on that set. And also because I controlled my schedule and never had an agent in, in the adult industry, I was booking my own things. I was having a lot of conversations with producers. There were a lot of times I was like, you know, this isn't a good fit. I'm not going to take this project for this month. I'm only shooting three movies this month or three scenes this month. And I've got 15 people that want to shoot me. So I would just, with all of them, like, what's this scene going to be about? Am I going to like, am I not going to like it? Not as many people had that kind of control over their autonomy as I did and didn't have the balls to just be like, no. And also it's all about that saving of the three months of money. The reason I say save your first 90 days is because once you have money saved, you can start to say no. When you don't have money saved, this is still a job. When you have money saved, it's a choice. A lot of people have these dysfunctional relationships with their parents when they grow up. And then as they become adults, a lot of times what can happen is, okay, both parties are like, you know what? Like, I messed up. I messed up. Let's figure out a way to reconcile this. I know in your case, there was a level of trust that just couldn't be rebuilt specifically with your mom. And then you, you and your dad have had your, your, own, your own set of issues. Talk about the process of acceptance there, because I feel like a lot of times people can let that kind of get in the way of their growth or who they are as a person, because they feel that not having a relationship with their parents could potentially deter them from living their best life. It's a very real thing. So this is, we're going to go back to 2015 because 2015 is the last time I've seen my parents. And before that time, they were very intermittent in my life. And the choice was normally me forcing myself on them and going home all the time. My dad never visited me anywhere I ever lived. Um, my mom visited me. I lived in California. I lived all over. I lived all these places. My mom visited me a handful of times. So, but I went home a lot. I also went home a lot because of my grandfather and my neighbor, Peggy, who I wanted to see regularly. But I also went home a lot because these were my parents and I wanted to have a relationship. My brother and I had a horrible falling out that you read about that I wrote about in my first book. And my brother decided that the second I got into the adult industry, I was banned from any family event, funeral, wedding, holiday, indefinitely, forever. My mom said, okay. So I was never allowed to go home on holidays, never allowed to see my mom on Mother's Day, my birthdays are on Mother's Days, like all these things. Okay, fine. I accepted that as like, you know what? Compromise, fine. I'll come home at other times. And, you know, my dad and I didn't speak from 16 to 42. Um, my mom and I from like 13 to 24. And then there was like another year. And then there was this. And it was my last trip home in August of 2015. I had just gave my final edit over to release my book. It was coming out in December. And I was excited to tell both of my parents. And that bus trip from New York City that I write about in great detail in the life back, I really had this moment of clarity. Like I had been 
all these sifting thoughts, getting over the industry, not being clouded by my identity, knowing who I wanted to be, knowing how hard I was working to do fantasy sports radio for two years. And I was like, I had a series of questions that I was going to ask my parents. Divorced, separate houses, separate conversations. And one of them was, have you yet listened to my show on Sirius XM? Because I'm doing something that's not adult related. I want to know, are you proud of me? Do you know that I'm trying to do something? Do you give any fucks at all? And both of them, no, had never. I'd emailed my mom listening links when they were running free trials. My dad had a new car. He could have listened at any time. And it was a list of events that made me realize that I was trying to make something work that had no potential of success. My mom made sure she made me feel bad about my choices in the adult business every single time she saw me. She made sure she knew, I knew how disappointed she was, what I did to their family, my family, what I did to my small town. Um, my dad and I just talked like we were strangers and just kind of caught up on like who died, who got married, what was, was very cold. And it was almost like visiting a neighbor that used to live, deliver a newspaper to. And that was the trip where I challenged my parents into having a conversation about abuse that took place in my childhood, abuse that my mom was aware of that my dad was not. And that challenge was faced by my mom's response of, you should probably go back to the city early. And that was it for me. I realized, you know what? I wrote my dad a letter. I gave him time to respond. He never responded. And that was when I realized if I don't close the door on this level of toxic, I'm going to be forced to doubt myself, feel bad about myself, be put in a negative space, and I'm not going to be allowed to shine. And I want to shine. This is my choice in life to shine. We should all want to shine. We should all want to be around people that help us shine. And so I gave it time. No one responded. I tried calling my mom for weeks after that visit wanted nothing to do with it. Uh, and, you know, once the first year went by, it got easier. After the second year, I was like, you know what? I'm, I'm healthier. I'm spending my free time visiting people who support me. I'm visiting my doing, I'm traveling more. I'm doing, instead of going back to Easton all the time, I'm going on trips, I'm learning things, I'm doing things. And I'll tell you, the pandemic was really sealed the deal for me. So I was like, if neither of my parents reach out to me during this crisis, the global crisis, then I have never mattered to them. And they clarified that for me. Nobody reached out to me. So in nine, in almost like, I guess, nine years, they, they still haven't reached out to you? And that, you know, it's weird because you have these dreams when you don't communicate with your family. You have dreams that maybe your mom died or your dad died. And so I'll wake up in the middle of the night and go search the Easton Express newspaper and go through the obits. Um, you do have these weird kind of things, but I don't think they know how to love me. Uh, I don't think they'll ever accept me. And I want to be in spaces where I'm accepted and welcome. I know one of the people that was like your guiding light growing up was Peggy, who was your dad's neighbor, neighbor right? Yeah. right? And I think a side of, a side of you that people might not be familiar with is a lot of what was guided from her. Like I know that she did a lot of baking when, she, when, uh, when you were younger. I know you bake for people in your, in your building. Um, she was a mentor to you. You mentor a lot of people now. Talk about Peggy and her personality and how that has inspired you to have this, this side of your life where you're, you're giving back and being of service. Peggy was just a good human being, just for the most pure, wholesome version of good human being. And we became very close because she could never have her own children. And we were the neighbor kids. And so we would be able to run over to her place and get cookies and, and be in her garden, be in her yard. And she was just overall, her entire existence was about making the world around her better and taking care of people that couldn't take care of themselves. She would knit. She'd, we'd sit and watch TV and she'd sit and crochet and knit. And she would crochet and knit these blankets for people that were in wheelchairs at hospitals. And then she'd deliver them and just, you know, give them out. This is what her entire existence was, was doing these things. She was the happiest person I knew. I never heard her swear. I never heard her gossip. She wrote her own eulogy. And in her eulogy, she admitted that her one dirty secret was that once a week she would go to Burger King and get a Whopper. 
and that nobody knew that she ate junk food because she raised all of her own vegetables, had well water, and just was always super uber healthy. She drove till she was 100 years old. She was fiercely independent. Her husband died when I was about eight. And so once her husband died, she just became my life. You know, on the weekends, I would sleep over there. I had a room at her house. When my husband and I were getting married, she offered to give us her house as our wedding gift. And I was like, I can't have this house. Your yard touches my dad's yard and he's not even coming to our wedding. Like I couldn't be neighbors with my father, but it was such a sweet offering, right? She was just whole and good. And she just reminded me every day that we are here to serve each other and that we're here to make the world a better place. She also knew that I wasn't going to stay in Easton, loved that I moved to California, wrote me once a week, and I have a whole box of her letters. For years, she wrote me letters. And it would be like the old school letter where it's like Thursday, June 4th, you know, 1997 in the corner, you know, like her handwriting was beautiful. They would always be the same. What the weather was like, what she planted, what was going on at the church group, uh, who she visited. But she was a, a great guide for me because I watched my parents just trying to accept a very toxic divorce in the 70s. I watched my dad's Italian family who really did not like my mom and would say awful things to me about my mom on the regular basis. Like it was just this, this chaos. But at Peggy's, it was just peaceful. We would be in the garden. We'd sit on the porch and drink lemonade. We'd, we'd sew. Every time I got invited to a wedding or a family function, First day after school, we'd drive to the store, we'd buy a pattern, we'd buy the fabric, we'd lay it out. And for the next two months, every day after school, we'd work on a little bit at a time. And she would keep this project going. We could have finished it in a day, but she knew we were slow rolling this project. We were all season. If it wasn't basketball season or I wasn't skiing, I was there sewing. And so she gave me that ability to be in space and not be in chaos. And I think that instrument she gave me allowed me to live on this, on the road and, and be at these crazy shows in the industry and do that and still be able to go back to my hotel room and have this like peace, this quiet and this space. She really helped me understand and divine that. And she was just pure. It was the only time my entire life that I'd been in the same place with my mom and my dad. And we all talked as if we were still family and it was at her funeral. Wow. She's the only person in my life who can make me cry. So. I want to talk about legacy. I think people, a lot of people, when they, 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 they think about you or they, they think about what you did, they would know you from the, the entertainment industry. I know that you're made for so much more than that with what you're doing now. You got your podcast, you're doing stuff with fantasy, with fantasy football, you're mentoring women, you're gathering like-minded individuals here in, in New York. What do you want your, your legacy to be? Well, you know, uh, your legacy, I say like porn is like a till death do you part legacy. I, I said the other day because, you know, we just dealt with the passing of Jesse Jane. And I said to a friend of mine, like, can you imagine I lived to be 98? I'm a dual citizen, ideally, Italy and, and, and U.S. and part time working on this winery still at 90s. And it says porn star Lisa Ann dies. You know what I mean? Like, that's what it's going to say no matter how old I am. I really want my legacy just to be the look on people's faces when they speak of me or mention me. And, you know, your friends and your people will keep you alive forever. Your body is your vessel, but your, the vibe that you leave behind is really your legacy. So I just want my legacy to be a really good, comfortable, safe vibe. Along that, those same lines, I'd love to get your take on like spirituality. I know growing up, I think your family was religious, but you're, the way they handled it was completely crazy, completely wild, yeah, crazy. And maybe I would say people who are quote unquote judging you would be like, there's no way that she has any kind of spiritual relationship given the life that you led, right? But from learning more about your story, I've heard you say that you, you take people to AA meetings, church, et cetera. What does your relationship with spirituality look like? So my father's side of the family was Catholic and they were like crazy Catholic. And my mom was really more almost a Buddhist in a sense where she just really believed in karma. And she said, if you believe in God, he's with you everywhere you are. He's always watching you. You're not hiding from him. So like her theory and his theories were totally different. When I'm visiting a church, I'll either go to a non-denominational or a Catholic church. It doesn't bother me either. Or I think a church is a place to 
think about peace and forgiveness and people coming together to do better the following week than they did the week before. And no matter how your guide guides you, whatever your God is, your belief is, whatever it is that makes you want to pick yourself up and make a little bit more effort to be better, whether it's be kinder to your neighbors, be more patient, less be less aggressive of a driver, like whatever it is that you want to like reel it back in, be on your phone less, whatever it is. But I think, you know, religion can be so incredibly valuable when it comes to trying to find peace. That's why it's a very useful tool when someone is going through rehab or AA, because now they need to fill a void of something that was captivating. Those high moments, those drunk moments were captivating. So now taking someone to church would help them find something that was captivating them in a better light. Um, I believe in spirituality. I truly believe in karma and really how you treat others, how you operate. I also believe in like the life of vibration. You know, like I had a bad habit for years of waking up and reading the news on my phone. And I realized that that was just starting my day in a low vibration. That There were more positive things I could read, like maybe just read a couple chapters of a good book and get some fulfillment from it than being like, oh, there was a shooting last night. Someone was stabbed in the subway, like not the frequency I need to start my day on. So spirituality is a starting of your day, a closing of your day and how you are operating with the existence of other people. I loved a time in my road on the road when I drove my first two years, in the 90s, I drove on the road and my friend that drove with me, he was very open and we went and visited churches all over the South. And it was such a special experience what that day meant. It was about the gathering. You know, if you know about the blue zones where people live the longest, it's faith, it's community. So you realize the church is just one part of the whole thing of that spirituality of the gathering. So whether you have it in a smaller form or, or you do go to church, I just believe that you should have some sort of something that you're believing in that's keeping you in check with being grounded and fulfilled and, and kind to other people. Yeah, going to church and developing a relationship with God, Jesus, higher power, universe, whatever you call it, I think can provide a strong sense of peace, fulfillment, can help you with forgiveness. Yes, yeah, so much with forgiveness, I think. Purpose, meaning. What did all of that like give to you? Was there did it help you with a lot of that stuff as well? It helped me with a lot of forgiveness, for sure. It helped me with a lot of forgiveness. It also helps you have empathy for other people when you sit in church and you look around and you realize what other people are managing that maybe you're not. A an elderly parent who's not well that they've brought to church, a child that's sick. I think sometimes it can give you a great level of perspective too to not take it for granted the things you already have. Every day we wake up wanting more than what we already have. I think church can also remind you to be so grateful for what you already have. Where do you think your life would have been had you have not gone down? Like if you hadn't gotten in that bikini contest and like that had started lit lighting the fire to, to see what, where that could turn into, where would Lisa Ann have been? It's, it's hard to say because I think my parents' divorce had more of an indicator than anything because my dad didn't want me to go to college. So my brother got college money and I didn't. And I just remember my mom throwing it at my face very young. I, I probably by eight years old knew that my dad didn't believe that women should be educated. And so there was already, I was already bitter. I was already a bitter kid at eight years old. I told my mother because she just told me this in 2013 when we were moving things out of my grandparents' home to get them into a nursing home. And you've probably read this in the book, the photos of that apartment we lived in. So we lived in their basement for years because my dad wouldn't help my mom with anything financially. And I looked at her at eight and she said, I look like a demon when I said it. But I said to her, yeah, I'm never having kids. Like, there's no way I'm going to have a child with somebody and then have to live in my parents' basement. How degrading. Like, I was disgusted already. So I don't know if my life would have turned out worse. Most of my friends in high school were getting pregnant. I didn't want a teen pregnancy. And I didn't want a pregnancy because I never wanted to have kids because my father scarred me so. My mother scarred me. Like, everyone scarred me so much to it. So I don't know. I had to find a way to get out of Easton. Because there was nothing else for me to do there other than have babies and have a shitty job. You always had this strong love for sports as a kid. And it even like throughout your career in the entertainment industry, you still had this strong love of sports that never went away. Do you think with the grit 
that you have and that you had as a kid that you would have found yourself? As soon as I started watching Arliss, I don't know if you remember this show. Arliss was a sports agent. It was an HBO show and it was like ahead of its time. It was like entourage in the 90s, right? Um, and Arliss was a sports agent and, you know, Michael Jordan was on. And by the way, none of the athletes were like PR trained then. So they were really awkward actors. And it was, you have to go back and find it and watch it. You will like it. Uh, and you'll know, I forget the lead character's name, but he's really into baseball. He does a, a baseball show on the fantasy sports network. Uh, Robert Wool, I think his name was, but I remember when I started doing fantasy sports radio, I was like, oh my gosh. But I learned about the fact that you had to be a lawyer to become a sports agent. And I was like, hell no. I never had the desire to sit in that much school. I knew that was my limit. Like, I'll learn bits of things at a time. I'll learn things that I'm interested in. But when I see people that are going to school to be a doctor, a lawyer, uh, anything that's more than four years, these are six years. I'm like so impressed by human beings that feel the ability they can sit that still and learn that much information and also take on such a great responsibility. Being a lawyer is a huge responsibility. Being a doctor is huge. I do nothing that is a huge responsibility. Nothing I do weighs in on society where it can hurt somebody. It's a choice to watch adult content. It's a choice to play fantasy football. It's a choice to gamble, choice to read. So that admiration, I never had the desire. I mean, because I, I mean, I, it just seemed like you had that strong passion for sports. Lazy, just too freaking lazy to go to school, man. No, nah, I don't think it was that. I just wanted to be working already. I'm like, how can people wait to do their job eight years? I don't understand. You're very independent now, obviously, as you, as you said. Do you think that your, your childhood affects that? Just given the fact that you said your dad didn't pay child support, he just cut you off financially, you had to figure it out. Like, you think that's at the root? Of course. You know, our trauma that takes place at a young age can really define us. And when I started to go out and make more friendships outside of the industry, and I was meeting women my age that had parents that were either still together or they didn't have a traumatic childhood, I could see the difference in their problem-solving skills. I could see the difference in how they operate their life already. It took me a little bit longer to get there because of all of that. There's no doubt Things in our childhood will impact us forever. We have to retrain our own brain. I've had to retrain my brain from growing up poor, you know, from being broke and my mother being so cautious at the grocery store and doing the math. I remember being young and thinking like, this is how we're living. And I realized that's a very normal thing for a lot of people. So yes, those things defined me in a way where I didn't trust a man enough to have a child with him. So then again, I sabotaged my life by doing porn and knowing that I'm probably not going to have a child. Like all of these things happen and counterbalance each other through life. Right. But I now know it has, I don't feel I missed out. I don't feel I missed. I wanted to travel more than I wanted to have children, but yes, for sure. It, it affected me differently than my brother per se. Um, as a woman, it affected me different because I saw my mom struggling financially. My brother probably didn't notice as much. You know, there were, there's a different impact for two kids growing up in the same environment. And how does all of that impact like dating? Like, are you, do you allow like a guy to pay for you? Of course the guy should pay for me to go out to eat. It should be the same. It should definitely be the same. I mean, it should be, I think dating really should be, now I know not everybody wants to invite people to their homes until they get to know them. But I always say if you go out for a really nice meal with someone, for the woman, our way to repay that is to cook a meal at home. The guy should pay when you're out, though. There's no doubt. But the woman can buy the groceries and cook at home. You know, there's a different way to do it, however you want to do it. But I think that that's a, a nice give and a take because what guy doesn't want a home-cooked meal? It's almost more valuable than the expensive meal. What is dating like for you? Like, how do you navigate that given that? I meet people through people. So I can't, of course, meet a stranger. I have enough people in my life that I've known for years that I've hung out with that we maybe travel together, have fun together. I have a lot of casual relationships. There was a long-term uh, relationship, a long-term casual un and serious back and forth for 13 years that I recently just permanently ended because I could not imagine going into a 14th year uh, because it wasn't changing. It wasn't evolving. It wasn't growing. It was stagnant. And I'd rather not be emotionally connected with someone that I can't grow with 
it's different to be in casual relationships where you don't look for growth. But when you are looking for growth and it's not happening, then there's a tug and pull that makes it not fun. Have you gotten to the point now where you feel like the people that you are surrounded with, they like, they truly love you for who you are, not who you were? For sure. I mean, I, there's a, there's a, there's a big difference, but I'm really fortunate to have met great people all over the world, friends that live everywhere. A lot of friends here in New York City, which is one of the things that made me really want to live here. A lot of my friends are still out West. The friendships uh, are incredible. My friends are all inspired by me. Uh, my friends, to my friends, like the adult industry is such a small part of this huge operation that I have going. And they're always just so impressed by the new things that I'm getting involved in. Like when I told all of my friends like, hey, I'm partnering with a winery in Sicily. This is part of my dream. My friends have known that I dream to retire in Italy. I dream to have a great place in Italy that's a a place all of my friends want a vacation so that once a month I get a guest. And so all of my friends from the U.S. come over. And so part of that dream would be tying in the winery where I could be looking towards retirement as a nice, slow-paced tour of the winery because I speak English and you speak English and, and having this next act in life. My friends were like, not one of my friends at this point will ever question or say, do you think that's a good idea? Because everything that they know I'm telling them, they know I've been thinking about it for a year before I let it even come out of my mouth. I'm plotting and doing business planning and looking at concepts way before I share my thoughts with other people, because I feel like you can get distracted by other people's opinions. So my friends are just like my biggest cheerleaders. I want to talk about the law of attraction, because I feel like you kind of alluded at it a little bit just there. I know you're a big fan of The Secret. Talk a lot about the law of attraction, manifestation. How have you utilized some of that stuff to be able to achieve everything that you've achieved in the last 10 years or so? I visualize it. You know, you visual, you're, man, you're manifesting it. You know, you're visualizing it. You're saying, okay, I can see this picture of this goal and I know I'm going towards it. I'm going to take incremental steps to get there. It might be very blurry right now because it's very far away, but it's something I really want. And it's something that I'm going to be driven towards. I learned something from this secret every time I rewatch it. When I was in the industry, you have this paranoia that everybody's judging you and everybody's looking at you a certain way. And so I decided like, act. well, what if that wasn't the case? What if I didn't think about that? What if I didn't carry that with me? And what I realized by not carrying that with me any longer was I was having more valuable conversations with people where it was not a thing. It was not even a thing. Like maybe they knew, maybe they had a hunch, maybe we addressed it quickly, but it wasn't a thing. So I was manifesting interactions with people that were not based on my own negative thoughts, putting more thought, positive thoughts out there. Um, the law of attraction, I mean, like-minded people find each other. And how do you do that? Well, if you walk around the block two different ways, you'll see two different examples. So walk around the block in the city and be scouring, your head's down, your shoulders are down, you're kind of throwing off weird energy and just see what kind of interactions you have. Then walk around the block and have your shoulders back, be smiling, smile at everybody that has a dog or a baby. That's always my rule of thumb. No matter what, if you have a dog or a baby, I have to smile at your dog and your baby. Uh, a little talk to a door guy walking by and you'll realize the law of attraction. It's that simple. It's an experiment. You can do it any time. You have no fun walking around the street like that. You have a ton of fun walking around the street with different energies. So that attraction, that like attracts like. What do you want that day? You want to go out and have good interactions? We'll go out there with a good attitude. So I, I use it every day still. I know you do too. I know you're a big believer. Yeah. But before we came into the studio, we were talking about like, you know, your, your life goals. And you were saying that somebody asked you about your big life goals. And you were like, you know, my number one life goal straight up just happiness. And that's what I want to be. But as far as just like one thing that you're like when you're visualizing now, when you're having these conversations with, when, with yourself, other than the Italy experience, like what is something right now that you're trying to attract into your life, whether it's personal, or professional? Um, really just peace, calm. This year is going to be really about calm and peace for me. Last year was a lot of travel. Uh, I, I probably lost anywhere from 30 to 45 days of my year just packing and unpacking. That's a lot of losing time. And every December I sit down, I evaluate everything that I did. I put a grid together of what I spend my time on. I throw it up into spreadsheets. I do pie charts and I sit and I, I sit with it the week between Christmas and New Year every year. 
I sit with my thoughts of how, what could I be doing better? This year, my thoughts were to be more deliberate with what I'm doing and to, to be doing less, but be doing it with more impact. So really right now, I'm just channeling in more calm, more repurposing content that I've already done, taking one or two big trips instead of a lot of little, little trips. But there's nothing that I feel I'm missing and pining for that's driving me or something that I want. There's no element that it's not like, oh, I, my big goal right now is make sure I get married or my big goal right now is make sure I don't have any of those things. I'm just cruising at a great pace. I love where I'm at, the existence, the interactions. You know, I have some relationships that I've become very close with, like the team at Sapphire and I host a podcast there and I've become very great friends with the producer and, and the whole team there. And I realized when I leave there, I feel good. Like when I'm leaving, like, I just love those people. You know, I go home, I shower, I put on my sweats, I sit down, have a tea. And I'm like, yeah, I love this interaction. I'm having those moments where I'm taking that time to process what I'm living day by day. And that's bringing me this new beautiful joy of like really being in the moment, being like, super grateful for the relationships that I've built post my other life. I know one of the things you may wish you had is like maybe some more time with your grandfather. I know your grandfather was somebody that was like this big role model to you. It was almost like the, the main father figure. Yeah, he was the male, male role yeah. model in my life for sure. Do you ever have conversations with him or channel in any of his wisdom that he shared with you? So anytime I'm fixing something, building something or opening a box from Amazon. So my grandfather's whole thing in life was he was very forward thinking and he understand that women were very discriminated against. He understand he never wanted me to be afraid to be a woman. And that's a weird thing to have someone say to you when you're young. He's like, I don't want you to be afraid to be a girl. So you're going to do everything that a guy does. My grandfather made me change the oil, change a tire. I can fix your plumbing. I know where to sh the shutoff valve is. And he showed me electricity, everything. And so when I'm opening a box from Amazon, I'll hear his voice going, box cutter out. Because, you know, you don't want to slice your finger off or something. Or like when I'm drilling something in, I was assembling, I uh, bought this new book. I put this bookshelf together over the holidays to house a new fantasy football trophy. And as I was doing it, you know, there's like four screws you're putting in with the drill. And my grandfather's theory was like, you do them all a little bit at a time. Cause if you do one and the other ones are off, then it's all going to be. And so whatever I'm building, creating, fixing, or handling something, I hear him right over my shoulder, making sure that I'm still doing it the right way. I will speak to him during those moments. And same with Peggy. There's so many times during the day where I have a Peggy moment and I'll, I'll channel her. Those were definitely the two greatest human beings in my young life. Do you look for qualities in men that, that your grandfather had as well? Yeah, because my grandfather had a good sense of humor, really good disposition. He was very mild mannered. He wasn't a gossip. It's, a gossip is a, is a big turnoff to me in friendships and, and any sort of relationships. It's very toxic to me. Uh, but yeah, I definitely would say that he would be a guide for me. Mm -hmm. A lot of people now are struggling with porn addiction and they're using it as a way to fill a void. A lot of people are not going out and pursuing intimate relationships. I, I heard you, I saw you do a talk. I think it was to a, some university. I think Oxford years Union. Ago. And, and, and I'm doing one at Temple University in February. So it was, it was super impressive. I encourage people to go watch it. And essentially it was just like a, ma a massive warning to people now because of how different things are in the accessibility. You know, if somebody's listening to this and they're, and they're struggling with porn addiction, I know you're not an, an addiction expert, but I know that you have an, a whole, uh, you have an ex experience. This that is definitely something that I'm going to be migrating into, into the next five to 10 years of my life is speaking on this topic, porn literacy. When does porn become unhealthy? Um, what should you, what should your guidelines be? And what's been interesting to me is, you know, I still run my OnlyFans. I use my OnlyFans for a library for all of the content that I own. I do a live stream once a month. And in my last live stream, I asked my users, hey, do you guys want to do a live stream that's more just like an IG chat and you guys can ask me dating questions and sex questions? And they were like, yes, definitely. We definitely want to do this. And what I realized from having these conversations is if you ate, fast food every day, seven days a week, you would get sick. 
if you watched TV five hours a night, seven nights a week, you're going to be unhealthy. You're consuming adult content, which was at one time regulated to 18 and up for a reason, no longer really seems to be a problem that, that the young people that are accessing it don't have the brain development yet to know what they're seeing. The dopamine release throws off their hormones. Everything's whack. I say for every one day you watch and enjoy, make sure that you don't the next day and then feel free to go back the next day. And I would say, try to cut down your consumption on your own and find ways to step away from the internet. We've become too reliant on parasocial relationships that are not two-sided, that are not real, that are romanticized in our own minds. And so there has to be a limit and a level. Give yourself a timer, put a post on your computer. Okay, I already watched for 60 minutes this week. Ask yourself how many hours you feel comfortable watching it a week. And really look at that number. Think about what you could be doing. What is it setting you back? I met two young kids that I found interesting. When they went to college, they decided together to go on a pact where they weren't going to watch porn for a year. And the reason they did it was because they were getting so desensitized that they couldn't climax with a partner. They had to be watching it. Because you're seeing something that's so graphic. You're having sex at home. It's real. Okay. It's not as as blown up. It's not lit. The girl's not screaming. All this is not happening. And what they realized was how they started to find women and little things about women attractive again, whether it was the smell of her hair as she walked by, whether it was her shoulder, the simplest things, a girl can now graze their hand on your arm and, oh, all of a sudden it's a big deal again. So that year for them made them realize they would still watch once in a while, but it was such a secondary thing as like a just in case or I'm up late and I can't sleep. It wasn't, oh, I can't wait to go home and watch it anymore. Yeah, I mean, this me saying this isn't to judge people who, who watch a lot I'm, of porn. Neither of us are. Right? But, what but there has to be a limit. And what I, I've never heard anybody say that they weren't thankful that they stopped watching porn. Most of the time when people say they stopped watching porn, they're like, oh my gosh, my life got better in so many different ways. So many people say that. Same with people who were addicted to video games. There were kids addicted to video games. That, that, that That's a thing too, but that, yeah. And it's like you, you wire yourself for instant gratification. You wire yourself that it's like, okay, like, I know that I don't have to work for something, so I'm just going to do this because it's easy. It's right here in front of me. And I think when it comes to, to romantic relationships, they take work no matter what level of intimacy you're at. You'll hear a lot of people say that there needs to be an emotional connection for somebody to, to sleep with somebody for that to like not, quote unquote, ruin the relationship. Like, Do you believe, generally speaking, it's important for people to build some sort of emotional connection with each other before going down that rabbit hole? It depends what you're looking for and what your situation is. You're a young athlete on the road and you're not looking to get locked down right now and you can meet up with girls, which you should be doing. Just be safe, have safe sex and, you know, trust the people that you're with. I think it, it's not a one size fits all. But I think the lack of intimacy that is forgotten because porn is so gratifying and it's so quick. Like when I do these speaking engagements, what I find fascinating is talking to young men and young women, women at campus about foreplay and about the buildup and about how, you know, when I was young, a guy would drive you home, you'd make out in the car, he'd put his hand up your shirt. And that was like the biggest thing. And you were like on the telephone telling all of your girlfriends, he put his hand on my shirt and you're not going to see this guy for another week. And it's gonna be another day. And it's going to be months of this, right? That slow roll is very important. That's where you start to build a connection. And that is something that can make that relationship and that intimacy more real because you can be yourself and you can say, Hey, I like this. I don't like this. But these talks are so important because we're only educating on sex ed in 22 States now in the U S that's it. 22 States, half of those States abstinence. That's what we're telling kids. That's sex ed. Meanwhile, they're exposing kids to content on their phone that no one knows how to talk to them about. And it's the same thing with like drugs and alcohol. When parents are afraid to have those conversations with their kids, it's like, listen, they're going to go off to college and it's going to be a free for all. And there's, it's going to be like all over the place. So it's like you either have some sort of conversation with them now about it so that you can at least try to have a rational conversation when they hear it from somebody that they hopefully respect and, and idolize and stuff like that. Or they're going to go off into college and they're going to be like, wow. They're going to wild out and get in the car, maybe drive and something bad could happen. I know self sabotage was something that you've dealt with throughout the course of your life. And now you've, You've gotten to a place where you're super confident, fulfilled, happy, all the things. 
Are there any insecurities you still walk around with on a day to day basis? And if so, what are they? Well, I'm aging. Are you though? That's really happening. I'm aging, um, which is something that all women face. And we have to have these conversations with ourselves. And especially because remember, I'm posting a scene from 15 years ago on my OnlyFans and looking at what I used to look like. I'd be like, oh my gosh, how young you were. And, um, you know, no, not really. I mean, the aging thing is definitely real. I'm always, we're always as women thinking about that, but I don't really think that there is, you know, I'm at a, I'm at a good spot in my life. I don't worry about what other people think like I did when I was younger. And I think a lot of insecurity is about worrying about what other people think. As long as the people I love, my best friends, my people are, are good and are happy with me. I'm happy. You know, if they come to me and say, I didn't like this. Okay. That's going to be something I would worry about, but no, there's nothing I really go out there and worry about. How has like your relationship with the industry changed? Like, how do you, how do you navigate that? Now you talked about how you have an only fans and you're still kind of, you go to some of these events and they do stuff at the Sapphire, but yet that industry tried to like destroy your life when you left. So how, how do you, how do you navigate that? It was really tough. It was if you read if you read the opening chapter to the life back, you'll understand uh, what you know, it's funny. One of the main people that was the worst to me, I ran into him last year at ABN. And as I saw him getting out of the elevator, I was with a friend and they were like, OK, this was this is the absolute worst interaction we were worried about with coming there. Right. And I said, was it OK? So I walked right up to him. I said, hello, how are you? How are things going? He looked like he just saw a ghost. And I said to him, look, water under the bridge. You know, we're all good. How's everything? You know, what's new? I knew he just had a baby. And he just turned around and walked away. He couldn't even speak. Wow. He got right back in the elevator. I'm like, that's weird. He just got out of the elevator. I chased him right back in the elevator. It's difficult, but I've realized that it was a, a, a small group and not its entirety. I also realized fear really drives people to make bad choices. And there's a lot of fear in the industry, right? There's a lot of fear when you're trying to get out. Then when you get out, you're less afraid, but there's a lot of people who are still afraid. And so I've found that it's been healthier for me now than ever to have a relationship with the industry because I'm kind of a pace car of like, hey, maybe I can help you get into a show at Sirius if you want to do an interview, or maybe I can assist you in me. I have a little conduit of like, the mainstream to the adult connection. And also I've done things I can help self-publish and introduce you to scribe. So I feel like I've become a wealth of afterlife information. And so it's important for me to still have my finger on the pulse and talent to know that they could reach out to be like, hey, how did you do this? And I'd be like, okay, let me, let's talk about it. I know one of your main goals, just what you've said throughout the conversation, and parts of the conversation is really providing this educational piece to people about the industry. Like when you go buy a pack of cigarettes, there's a warning, you know, may cause lung cancer, et cetera. Same, there's other warnings with different things that are, can be dangerous to your health. Do you think that's what the industry needs is like, cause again, it's like, unless somebody comes in and outlaws it or gets rid of it, it's not going away, right? It's not the industry. It's the government. This is not an industry thing. The industry will run the shit into the ground. Okay. The industry it's 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 a mob and it's it's a wild thought process and though there's normalcy in it there's still risk takers that would just push the envelope and push the, there's scenes being created that shouldn't even be created no woman should be violently hit or anything like that so there's nothing the industry needs it's the government that needs to regulate we couldn't figure out how to regulate the internet there are countries that are doing it but like when you go to turkey even though porn is illegal, they can still get it on Twitter. Right. So they're finding gaming devices that they're using VPNs. They're getting this content. Like they're going to find it. But the industry doesn't, it, it self regulates when it comes to testing, but it really is the government. If you know there's states now, I think what state is it? Is it Utah where all my friends um, that, that travel and play sports are like, yo, we can't watch porn in Utah. I had to get a VPN. Uh, so there's some states that are already banning if you're if you don't have a state ID to prove that you're over 18. Uh, it's really about we should be logging in by driver's licenses. There should be some way to prove somebody's 18. But the biggest damage mentally we're seeing is from ages 10 to 15. Content being watched by that that age group right there with men. It's the definite production of incels because that dopamine release. Uh, kicks them into their glands starting to produce. So they actually jumpstart from 
development. And what happens is that time from 10 to 13, 11 to 14 for young men is when young men develop empathy and compassion. And if they fast track over to that dopamine release, that addiction to that sex, that's wiped out. And so, and for young women, it's making them afraid. It's making them do things they wouldn't have done on their own. You're experiencing sex before you know what the experience of sex is when you're watching it that long. That's really what we have to do better. And I think parental controls, the way it's delivered to apps, like there just has to be better ways to make sure that it's getting into the right hands and that it's not destroying young people. But from like an intimacy desensitization, like principle, like I know you talked about, like you said, like, you know, you're educating people to say, okay, like if you watch it one day, you shouldn't watch the next. Like, do you think that if more content creators like kind of came together and were providing those same guidelines to people that they you make, make money, it, you're not no. going to not make money. Right. And you have a shelf life to make this money as a content creator. So you have to make as much money as you can in that short period of time. I don't really think it's on the creators. Look, I think, again, it's government. The fact that we're not giving sex ed in every school in America is crazy. And, and let's next step that. If we're giving sex ed, we should be giving porn literacy classes. We should be talking about, hey, this is how this is made. This is the consent conversation that's taking place before the sex scene. This is how they're getting tested to make sure they're not spreading STDs. There should be a literacy understanding of what it is they're watching. That's where it's going to have to start. It's really the level of greed in the adult industry is never going to regulate less. Right. They want the addiction. They want the addiction. They want the addicted user that is just on that site all day, helping them drive traffic. Yeah, it's crazy how addictive it's become. Like I said earlier in the conversation, it was just, it was so much, it was, it was much more difficult to get access to this stuff. Oh my right? God. I remember finding my dad's magazines uh, in his cedar closet and, you know, knowing that like we had to stack them exactly the way they were when we found them and also looking at them. There was no graphic shots. There was no spread shots. It was the 70s. Then we had like the cable scrambler where you thought you could hear a little bit of the Playboy channel, but it was all scrambled. That's what we did. Now it's right here and it's got to be so intense. I mean, it's similar to someone having a shopping addiction. If you have a shopping addiction, apps can be the worst thing that ever happened to you because they're always emailing you. Oh, there's a sale of 15% off and you could just be on your phone gambling addiction. These are all very similar. But what's happening in America is young people are having sex less than ever. That's because they're watching porn instead, which is not good socially because we want them to interact and have real time experiences. Um, it's a different level of addiction and it can be very destructive. It can be destructive on marriages as well as someone's watching it, their partner doesn't know and they find out and then they feel cheated on in a sense because that communication wasn't there. And I think your message could get mis might make it misconstrued at times because it's like it's not like you're advocating for people just to go out and have sex all the time. I think your message is like put the porn down, have real have real life interactions because the porn is going to destroy that. Like I think one of the, the the things that I heard is that you get used to watching other people have sex that you can't have sex with somebody in front of you and that's like something that's incredibly dangerous because you you, get, you just get used to that. And imagine what that does to somebody who's looking to have a romantic relationship. Or someone who's looking to have a child. Right. You know, all of those things, it does. It, it really can get in the head of like, no, this isn't doing it for me. So what's next for you? Like you've done so much. Like I look at your career and what you've done, how you've evolved, everything that you do. I mean, I feel like every time I look, you're doing something else. Like what's, what's next for you? So I've, uh, I, I am taking 2024 as a little sports break. After 10 years of being in the fantasy sports and sports betting space, I have been able to watch it grow incredibly. And now it's a really crowded space. And as we saw SI crumble last week, no more SI. Sports Illustrated is gone? Gone. Wow. Uh, and, so, and so is their staff. So they all found out by email. And what I started to really survey last year was this kind of buckle of like, okay, there's too much content. There's too many small sites. They all hope to get bought out. They're not going to. There's going to be a lot of people in this space looking for work. And I don't need the money enough to be taking away from that space where other people need the work. So I'm stepping back and added in a little 
fun in the comedy space with Sirius XM and doing a show called Better Haves That's with a awesome. comedian, That's Brett awesome. Raybould, who I adore. I met Brett in 2021. And the second I met him, I was like, we're going to be doing something Some together. Those clips are so funny. He's so funny. We have so much fun doing it. It's on raw comedy. So that'll be, we did our six episodes. Now they're going to be doing a regular contract with us. We'll be in you know, 20 episodes at a time. They're, they're doing things like the Netflix style now. That's a ton of fun. I get to be in studio instead of working from home, which is also really fun for me. The Wine Venture, partner with the winery in Sicily. I, so that will be a new adventure for me. Third book is probably coming soon since I feel that this is a really good time to write. I feel like it's important to really get out there the word that maybe um, we've overemphasized the glamour of OnlyFans and maybe we should reel in that everybody should be on it. You know, I think I'll, I, I've gotten quite a few friends who decided to dabble in it and their boyfriends weren't comfortable with it. We just sat down. I, I did the money theory with them. Like, okay, you're making a thousand bucks a month. This is not worth you doing this. Like, but that's real. Even though you're only seeing on the news, the million dollar, there are millions of earners on there. The average earner is making two to $2,500 a month. So 2,000 to 2,500. And that's before taxes. That's before anything else. It's not worth it. That's not worth it. Are you kidding? So um, next, it's hard to pinpoint what really is next. I'm just going to continue to flow. I don't see myself ever really truly retiring. So like having all these little small projects makes me super happy. I love to communicate. That's where the podcasting comes in. And now to kind of switch my voices from my podcast to backstage convos for Sapphire and then doing this comedy on raw comedy for better halves. Like it's just the greatest variety of using all the skills I learned doing sports radio and being able to just flex a new muscle and laugh and just laugh. That's amazing. I mean, like where can people find you? Everything's simple. The real Lisa Ann for all social media platforms, us, uh, Instagram, Twitter, um, TikTok, uh, Facebook, also my podcast, the Lisa Ann experience. You can find everything on my timelines. And if you don't see my timelines, then obviously you've already been blocked. <laughs> 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 noted one of the, the my favorite parts of the podcast is being able to give somebody a platform to share a different side of them that people might not see and i think that's what we've done in this conversation and i think that people are going to enjoy just seeing the side of you that maybe they're just not familiar with thank you so much for watching if you like this video i really think you're gonna like this video as well i'll see you there